Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 24 of the Gateway Project. And it occurred to me that in a previous episode, I had sent a hydrocargo carrier to Minmus. And I recorded it, and I did it, but I never showed it. So we're showing it. We're showing it, baby, and we're showing it all, and we're showing it now. So here we are, we have set up our intercept with Minmus because what I wanna do is when I decouple that injection stage, that transfer stage right here, it will go down and smash into the surface of Minmus and I won't have to worry about orbital debris because we know from last episode that Bill's gonna have a conniption and roll around on the ground all upset if we don't uh, get rid of all that. So I've set up an intercept with the uh, KSS number two, the Kessler Serenity Station and we grab that orbit and then we zip around and capture there so that we can go and rendezvous with that Minmus station. Jebediah has been jonesing for a Kit Kat or a Corky bar. He's just going crazy in there right now. He took whatever was left from the other Kerbals and said, have you got any idea who I am? I'm the head Kerbal in charge and you'll have to go and get your own Kit Kats. These are for the leaders. But now they're happy. There is a big transfer in progress right now. I'm using my TAC fuel balancer to actually transfer all the food and the fuel and everything. It actually, I sped it up right there, but it took probably five minutes at least in order to click on all those things because for whatever reason, every time I click on one of the little buttons to move something around, uh, it, the TAC fuel balancer pops up the little dialogue to interact with it right on top of the button, which means every time I want to interact with the next one, I have to move it. Oh, look at that explosion. And look at that fuel tank. And where is that fuel tank going? And going. And going. And going. And going. And going. And going. <laughs> and going. Don't worry. It eventually came down. It took about a half an hour, but it came down. So now we are waiting for our launch window because it's time to send up a very special one. Let me go take a look at it with you. Hey now, so after the Columbus module was docked up and before the LMPS was docked up, there was a March 2008 launch that was in between the two of them and it was the, K well for me it's the KSS 23. Actually, this is gonna be 24, isn't it? The Jules Verne ATV number one, and because it was the first, I'm going to build it and launch it. And not only that, because some of the parts look really, really similar to the Ariane rocket, I'm trying to make it super accurate too. This is not one of my standard KLS launch systems. This one is specifically an Ariane 5ES. If we zoom in a little closer here, you can see that I have the similar boosters like it would have and the same kind of engine. I have even put on my own little upper stage that's trying to look a bit like the real upper stage. And hidden under the fairing, I have the ATV number one itself. Checking out the bottom, you can see I've got the four engines. I even have, by putting on these individual monopropellant RCS nodes on a strut, I have even configured all of the, that RCS to be the same number and direction of the RCS on the real thing. Uh, the real thing has four nodes at the top that have two side thrusters each, and down at the bottom it has four nodes that have five thrusters each. I've used AIES solar panels here, and it has a bunch of lights around it for docking at the top and just for seeing it on the sides. And here's a remote tech antenna that I can use for communication. Inside, I have my CPU down at the bottom with a, gr a short range remote tech, a long range dish hidden away in there for longer communication in case I want it, monopropellant tanks, a gyroscope, and then we have the cargo bay. This is the section that the crew would be able to go into. They 
would go in through the docking node here and access all of my cargo. And there's all kinds of space in there for Kerbal attachment containers and whatever I want to put in there. Oh, one last thing. To get the thrust and dimensions right, I had to tweak my values here. I reduced the solid fuel in these boosters way, way, way down, as well as the thrust is just a little under half on each booster. This tank has way under its fuel capacity and the engine has been modified to be a little less uh, powerful as well. All of that is just so that I can get a nice replica going here to get the right dimensions uh, without having way too much fuel or way too much thrust to weight or anything like that. A tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage Vulcan. And we have lift off of the Jules Verne ATV-1 on its way to the KSS here on March 9th, 2008, heading for the KSS atop an Ariane 5 ES rocket, ready to deliver cargo including life support with precious snacks and I suppose water too. This is mission number 71 of 143 missions, which puts us roughly at about halfway done with the Gateway Project now. On my EVA list at this point in our history, we are at mission EVA number 104 out of 175. So we're more than halfway done on the EVAs. Actual EVA number 104 wasn't shown because when I launched my Columbus module, I already had the science experiments out on the outside of it because I just didn't think it was going to be that easy to keep my part count down and not have them included. But had this been real, uh, an astronaut went outside and actually hooked up those science experiments on the outside of the Columbus module. Uh, that was 104, which means we went past 100 already. Interestingly, uh, EVA number 100 included Peggy Whitson, who became the woman with the most EVAs, totaling five, and the most time spent on EVA of 32 hours and 36 minutes. And that was all, of course, on top of the fact that it was the 100th EVA of all time, which was a landmark in and of itself. Now, I am going directly from the surface straight to the station again. You can see there, even though we are suborbital, I have just set up a maneuver node that puts me on an intercept with the KSS. And this, I will give you a little uh, spoiler, turns out to be one of the best ones I've done yet. You can see the KSS is coming up from behind me right there. And uh, I've set up the maneuver node to try and match my velocity with them. And it works like a charm. As they're coming up from behind me, I'm slowly speeding up in order to match their velocity. And by the time they arrive, we're going practically, practically the same speed. Look at that, here they come. So nice and slow, riding up behind me. And now all I have to do is rotate and go up there and dock to the back of the Zvezda module. This is technically a little bit inaccurate because in reality, because it was the first ATV, they let it stay in orbit for three months before they actually had it go and dock up. They were doing various tests on it and stuff while it was up there for that time. But then finally it docked up with the uh, Zvezda module, the same as mine did right there, and it stayed there for about six months before it undocked and came back and burned up over the Pacific Ocean in one of the most well-covered re-entries of any spacecraft ever. 
Bob is out here right now doing an EVA inspection of the station, although I guess since he just flew past the Columbus module, I could try to argue that he was out there doing mission number 104 of the EVA list, putting on some science experiments on the Columbus module or something. Whoopsie! Well, it's time to launch the ELMPS. I'll tell you what that is in a second. Uh, you notice there I hit the staging and apparently I didn't have my engines in the group. Uh, or no, no, I didn't have them throttled up. That's what it was. I didn't have my engines throttled up. So when the staging went, uh, the decouplers dropped my engine right down on the launch pad. Uh, fortunately, it seemed like it's launching okay anyway. It didn't damage the engine. So here we go. Uh-oh, what's going on? It's rotating. Well, it's flying straight. Okay, well, it's flying straight at least. I guess it'll probably settle out when it gets out of the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, there, see, it got better. So this is the ELMPS, and what is the ELMPS, I hear you ask? Well, it is part of the Japanese section. The Japanese have a six major component section of the space station. Oh, and here goes stage one separation. And you see those little thrusters on the side that are firing? You may not know what those are for, but those are to push the rocket up so that the fuel settles down below. The lower gravity forces and the separation forces and the free fall cause the fuel to not settle toward the bottom where it needs to get pumped out into the engines. So those little thrusters on the side, they fire and they push the rocket forward just a little bit. That forces the fuel down toward the pumps and then the pumps can get the engine started. And once they're going, then the force of the engines is pushing the rocket and the fuel stays down at the bottom there. So I was saying there are six parts of the Japanese section. Uh, the first component that went up was called the ELM, the uh, Experiment Logistics Module. It's the pressurized section, which is why it has the PS on the end. It was launched on STS-123 Endeavour in March 2008. And if we scale it down into my terms, it is supposed to be roughly about the same diameter as it is high, about 2.5 meters tall and 2.5 meters in diameter. Uh, okay, so let's see. Also in this launch, we were supposed to launch the Dexter, which is a robotic arm. However, I already have a whole bunch of parts. Also, the arm is very complicated. It's got all kinds of joints and I would have to make a massive robotics thing if I wanted to do something like that. And finally, it doesn't really have a specific location where it goes. It can move around the station, so I'm not actually going to put up the Dexter. Hopefully Dexter doesn't get all upset with me and try to like erase my credit profile or something crazy like that. Uh, so the reason why I bring that up is NASA had an April Fool's joke where Dexter uh, supposedly had become intelligent and had started saying that uh, I want to be called Dexter the Magnif Magnificent from now on and it promised that uh, humans would still w wouldn't be left out in the new world order when robots took over the world. And there it is. The ELM is now in place and our little tug slash injection stage is allowed to decouple and head back home for the loving embrace of our atmosphere. In the next three episodes, we will see two of those episodes where uh, more of those Japanese modules are going to come up and get docked to the station. The next episode is going to contain the really large module that the one we just docked is actually supposed to go up on top of it, uh, but we don't have that here yet, so we have to dock it currently up on top of Harmony. Also, just like with the Dexter robotic arm, I've got enough robotics on the station for myself right now. And I don't think I'm going to be putting on the Japanese robotic arm, although that is one of the six things that comprise that whole section there. Uh, then we'll uh, go one episode where we're going to do the last of the solar panels. And then following that, uh, all three of the remaining Japanese sections go on and that will complete the six that comprise that Japanese area. And then the mission after that, we're going to put up a new Russian module. And I know I have a fan out there who's really excited about that one. So check it out right here. So I uh, picked up one bit of debris and I deorbited it. 
and then I saw another bit of debris and I went to deorbit it and it turned out it was the same debris. So I ended up on a suborbital trajectory. Oh no, and now look, I've got no communication, no comms, and we're heading for a cliff, but oh, just in time, we get communications back somehow. I don't know what sent the signal, but I'm so happy. So immediately we aim straight up in the air and fly over. So, oh uh, yeah, and we just clear the mountain. If I hadn't gotten communications back right there, we would have lost Bill's catcher number three. That would not have been good. Can you imagine the look on Bill's face if I said to him, or Jebediah said to him, uh, sorry, Bill, but we just, whoa, there goes our station again. We're getting so lucky that we're not hitting that. Uh, sorry, Bill, we sent the wrong one the first time and the second one we just destroyed. Oh, boy, I think he'd kill himself. I don't know. I, I, or kill Jeb, one way or the other. And snag! We have another bit of debris, so that's two down. Over the course of the next episodes, I will probably be uh, maybe even off camera. I don't know how interesting it is to see these things get caught. Uh, but I'll be collecting some of that whenever I can and deorbiting it. Uh, might not show it or maybe just throw in like five seconds and say, hey, look, everybody, I got rid of another one. One way or another, though, we're done with Bill's Catcher 3 for right now because we have another special launch. This is not a normal rocket. It does not have a normal payload up there. It has something special, something secret. Oh, what could it be? It looks like we might be passing through Max-Q right now. There's a little bit of a shake right on there, but it gets better. Yeah, it's better. All right, so we're on our way, but where? Where are we going and what could we possibly be delivering? Oh, by the way, everybody, uh, I want you here to look away from the computer. Oh, there's something interesting out your window. Uh, yeah, oh, look out your window. Yes, it's fascinating out there right now. Yeah, um, yeah, there's nothing to see on the screen at the moment. Uh, okay, just uh, keep looking out your window. One more second. And uh, okay, uh, yeah, it's done. You can come back and look at the screen. Yeah, we're, we're uh, still flying here. Nothing happened while your back was turned away. Uh, we're just flying our rocket along with uh, not a care in the world. Okay, uh, but like I said, where could it be going? Well, we're going to find out in, a, in the next episode, not in this one. I don't want to get behind on showing my rockets anymore, so let's make sure we show the uh, ELMPS in this episode. So on here we have a uh, normal rocket, normal injection stage, a little decoupler on that. And this is supposed to be flipped the other way around when it docks up on top. Uh, what we have is just lights and one part. So I believe if I take these lights off from here, here, and here that that's now down to a single part. Yep, throwing a mech jeb on there lets me see that there's a part count of two, so one for mech jeb and one for the part that I've constructed welded together. Uh, on here we have a uh, welded in is the docking node and an end cap, an emptied fuel tank, an Oscar fuel tank to represent the EFU, which is the exposed facility unit. And then another little upside down end cap right there to cover up the color that's on the underside. On the next Gateway project, we are going to send up the Japanese pressurized module, the next component in Kibo, their section, and we will find out where that other rocket was going and what it can do. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts. <laughs>